This comment was left on a recent video titled, Bigfoot Can Make Fire. Here's what Sharon Rose 1226 wrote. Yes, I have heard one encounter story of Sasquatch using fire. I don't remember whose channel it was, but it was about 18 months to two years ago, and the encounter was based in a forested area in Alaska. The author of the story was a young adult male winter camping who had gone early to set up camp before his friends arrived. There was knee-high snow, and the area had ravines and ridges. After setting up camp, he went for a snowshoe hike. While he was hiking, he noticed a large campfire in the distance. Thinking it may be his friends, he climbed up a small rise to meet up with them. Too late, he realized he had walked up on two Sasquatch. I don't remember much more detail, except he took off back down the ravine, thinking that he knew he would be in danger if he lost his footing. He tried going unnoticed, but soon realized the Sasquatch were aware of him as he heard one of them scream. By the time he got back to his camp, his friends were there and noticed his disturbed state. I don't remember what happened next. Somehow, they got out safely riding four-wheelers, I believe. Anyway, that's what I remember. And it's the only encounter story about Sasquatch and fire that I recall hearing. Have a great fall season, everyone. Stay safe out there. In 2002, I went on what I thought would be a routine three-day-long weekend backpacking hike along Old Town Orleans Road in Maryland that runs right through the Green Ridge State Forest and borders West Virginia. I had spent the night at Camp 72, which is off Doug Hill Road, which is branched off of Old Town Orleans Road. They are actual roads, in theory, and cars can drive on them, in theory. But I mostly see four-wheel drive type cars and SUVs because the road is pretty rough to drive. I walk it with my backpack. I got up that morning before sunrise. I know this area very well, and I knew where I wanted to see sunrise. That was at the Lookout Overlook on Carroll Road. That was about a mile and a half from the camp area I stayed at. It was June, so sunrise was a little before 6 a.m. as I recall. When I left the camp area, it was still very dark, and I had a headlamp on. I started walking, and right away, I was hearing something over to my left walking in step with me. I called out if someone was there. I had done this exact hike and early morning thing on that exact road probably a half dozen times or more, and I had never had a single thing happen. I stopped quickly, and I held my breath to listen. Whatever it was, it was clearly trying to be stealthy. But I heard branches move, and I heard some get cracked, and those cracks were from the bigger limbs. You could tell by their sound. So I knew it wasn't something small and close to the ground. I was puzzled, because all I'd ever seen through there were small things, things other than deer. I turned my headlamp off and I moved back about 30 feet on the road as quietly as I could. If someone or something was stalking me, I didn't want to show my position. Although it was getting to be blue hour and lightening up, I could see shapes and shadows without the lamp once my eyes adjusted. I waited and I soon heard very stealthy movement. It was hard to hear, but... I was listening for it. Then right out on the road where I had just been a minute before, I saw a big, shadowy shape slowly come out from the left. You know I about crapped my drawers. If that was a guy who had wanted to rob me, I was in some serious trouble. He was huge. I did have some bear spray with me, and it was on the outside of my pack, and I can get it off of that pack in a split second. I practiced enough just to be sure. So I turned my headlamp back on as I unclipped the bear spray at the same time. I was hoping to blind whoever it was, and once they knew the element of surprise was gone, 
I was hoping they would make a hasty retreat. Now that that shadowy shape was all lit up, my heart was slamming against my rib cage. It wasn't shadowy anymore. It was a huge, hairy, and ugly, well, thing. There's no way what I was looking at was someone in a costume. Those eyes were real enough, and I had seen them for just a split second when I turned on the headlamp. I saw the nose crinkle and the lips curl as it raised an arm to shield itself from the light. Costumes don't have masks that crinkle and respond like that. Well, none I've ever seen anyway. Maybe in Hollywood. And the shine I saw in those eyes, that was real enough. And those eyes, they were more than a foot above mine. So unless this guy is over seven feet tall, no way it was a costume. And let me be real here. That's all I can tell you about this whole scenario. I saw that, and I knew what it was right away. I got scared, I can't lie. I turned and I ran. I know better than to run like that. But I did it anyway. I didn't run, though, the two times I ran into a bear in all the years I've been hiking. So I can only tell you that there was something very primal about the way I reacted to seeing it. I can only describe it as being over seven feet tall. My guess is it was about three feet wide. It was very thick and had a very bulky build. The hair was a very dark brown, like the darkest wood stain you can get without it being actually black. It wasn't a shiny hair, though. It absorbed all the light. I saw glare from the eyes, but dang if I could tell you the eye color or the shape, because I can't. I can't even tell you what the face actually looked like. I lit it up, and that arm came up immediately. I have read lots of accounts where they stink real bad or make a lot of noise, but I didn't smell anything, and it didn't say anything or yell at me. Now this probably doesn't sound like a big deal, but I was standing there alone in a remote place, and the nearest people that I knew of were at least a half mile away from my location. They might have heard me yell in the stillness of the pre-dawn, but they might not have ever found me or any pieces of me. And that is what I was thinking about when I ran. I know running defied all I knew about how to handle animals that I encounter, but really... I didn't think what I saw was an animal. I really don't think so. Animals, as we humans think of them, well, they don't walk around on two feet. They don't lift real arms with real fingers up. And yes, I could see actual fingers. They don't do that to block the light. I'm not saying this was actually human. Heck, I really can't say what it was other than... It is exactly what people describe as Bigfoot. I'm including a screenshot from Google Maps to show you where all of this happened. X marks the spot to the best of my figuring. I still backpack there. I still camp around there. But I do not walk the roads in darkness anymore. Thanks. Signed, Stephen. I guess you could say that this all started in the fall of 2020. It was in the middle of the shutdown, and being a waiter at a national chain restaurant, you know my job went poof early on. I had no choice but to move back to my parents' place in the Ozarks in Missouri. They had moved there when my dad retired from the military. Their property was in the middle of a strip of other properties, all of which were bounded to the front and to the back by a road. Now, ironically, it was the same road in the front and on the back. It was a road that went around in a horseshoe shape. At the back of my parents' property, there was a mobile home that they had used for extra rental income. But like me, that renter's job went belly up and they had no choice but to leave. I moved into that trailer, so we all had a little more space. We hadn't lived together in over 17 years, 
so it was a little bit of an adjustment. There was a path between my parents' house and the trailer I was staying in. Now, that path was almost never used while they had renters, and it had become quite overgrown. Once I was told it had been wide enough to ride a four-wheeler through there, but it was so overgrown it was a walking path if you walked sideways in certain spots. So that summer I was working on cutting back some of the path between the houses while they still had a lot of leaf out. While working, I discovered a game trail that went right across this path. It was a very wide game trail and heavily used from the looks of it. I assumed that my father knew it was there. When I mentioned it to him, he was surprised, and he said, Well, it must be new. When they had bought the property, my father went over every inch of it, because he is a hunter, and he said, There was no game trail there. That was eight years prior. Together, he and I went out, and we scouted that game trail. To our surprise... Not far in, we saw some very deep prints. They looked like they were made while the ground was still muddy, but it was now dry and cracking. But there was no mistaking the human-like shape of those prints. The five toes were clear, as was the overall shape of the foot. When we followed the prints, we could identify where the toes had curled up, as if to get a better grip on what was presumably slick mud where the ground sloped. We saw the side steps and the slipping sliding of those sideways steps as they went down to the stream that ran nearby. I asked my father what he made of those tracks. I knew what they looked like to me, but I wanted to hear my father say it. But he would only shake his head and he said that he didn't know what had made them. It wasn't human and it wasn't a bear. So he shook his head again and said, I don't know. I tried every way I could, but I couldn't get him to say Sasquatch, and I really did try. I thought right away that that is what the prints must have been, just from their size. They were much bigger than either mine or my father's foot. But my dad wouldn't take the bait. When we got back to my parents' house, we sat and talked about it over dinner. Out of nowhere, my mom pipes up and says, I bet that's why there's been no deer this year. Something has spooked them off. I bet I know what it was. My father looked up with a surprised look on his face, and then he said, Well, you might be right, but it's probably just hunters all around us that spook the deer. No matter what, he wouldn't concede that it could be something else and he refused to believe that the prince we saw had anything to do with the lack of deer. My mother then said that she thought maybe that accounted for all the weird things she'd been hearing out there. My parents' habit was to sit out back in the evenings when it was nice after dinner. She said that they had heard some very strange things in the woods for the last two years. They had heard some howls, some grunts, and they had seen trees breaking They watched the tops move further back, but when they would go out and investigate, there was nothing there, though sometimes they found trees pushed over. Sometimes late at night, she said they would hear the sound of something heavy walking around. Sometimes it sounded like something was being dragged through the trees. Then she said that this year the sounds were more frequent, closer, and it was the first year that they hadn't seen any deer at all at dusk. She then said she thought maybe Momo had made it into their neck of the woods. I'm sitting there looking at her thinking, why am I just now hearing about this? You've let me walk around back and forth out there. Now when my mother said all of that, my father gave her a look and said, well, he didn't think it was quite that. As I said, I was taken aback. I had been walking that overgrown path back and forth at all hours of the day and night, and I'd never heard a peep about any of this. If something was out there, I could have been grabbed at any time. When my dad said that he didn't think it was that, my mom grounded on him and asked, Then what? What is it? 
Now, here's where I have to tell you that my mom has always been a very serious, scaredy cat kind of person, and with kind of good reason, I guess. She was raised in the town of Texarkana. Yes, that Texarkana. The one with the famous murders from years ago. Now, although she grew up there after they happened, that being in the 1960s and 1970s, she was raised to be afraid of everything. You see, her mother was a friend of one of the victims. She knew her very well. And after her murder, she was afraid of everything. My dad said that's where my mom learned it, from her mother. She was literally raised to be afraid. If it was dark out in my mother's mind, there was something out there lurking, waiting to do harm. So that's my mom. She jumps at everything. My dad, however, is the exact opposite. You can't get him to jump or even flinch most times. And I was sitting there right between the two of them. Literally and metaphorically. With the knowledge that there might be something on the property, I began watching and listening more. I found reasons to walk that path between our houses more and more. I guess I was sort of courting danger because I kept finding reasons to do that walk, first at dusk and then in outright darkness. My mom would have a fit and tell me not to do it, but my dad would just calmly ask me if I was armed. I always said, of course I am, even when I wasn't. Now, don't ask me why I was courting danger. Now, no one in their right mind wants to encounter a Sasquatch, especially the Missouri version of it. It's pretty aggressive. For some reason, I got a thrill out of walking that path. Just knowing, just knowing it could be out there. Maybe it was an adrenaline rush. But with every step on that path, I just knew I was going to feel a big old hairy hand reach out and grab me. But it didn't happen. I checked that game trail and down by the creek regularly. No new tracks. The old tracks were obliterated with a hard October rain, so I couldn't even look at them again. The creek rose to cover the sideway steps on the slope bank. I was disappointed. A few times I left apples or other food out near the stream on a rock. One time I went back there within two hours after leaving food out, and every crumb was gone. It was daylight, but of course it could have been a raccoon or really any other animal. But I wanted to think it was Momo. Now the winter months rolled by, and there were no more sightings of it, and neither did I hear anything like my mother had described. Now of course you know I'm still writing because that wasn't the end of it. Not at all. The winter came and went, and I was disappointed more than I can say. But now the spring came, and it was a very wet spring felt like we had rain at some point almost every day. We didn't, of course. It just felt like it. Everything was damp, and it stayed damp. The temperatures went up and went down. The creek swelled and overflowed its banks at one point by more than ten feet on either side. It wasn't quite a flooding situation, but it's enough to tell you it was a very wet spring. Perhaps because of that, we had turkeys that moved on to our property and took up roosting in a batch of trees within about a hundred feet of the back deck of my trailer. Before the trees budded out, I could sit there and watch them come down at dusk. Sometimes I'd even see them during the day, just walking around and sometimes just resting. Early one morning, though, I went out on the back deck with my coffee. So this was April of 2021. It had rained through the night. The temps had dropped quite a bit more, yet the ground was still very warm. So lots of low, misty fog everywhere, which I find beautiful and calming to look at. 
Then I heard the turkeys yelping and gobbling all of a sudden. Well, something had disturbed them, I thought. I stood up and went to the end of the deck to see down that way. But all I saw was mist and fog. Then all at once I saw something larger than a man, but looking human-shaped, jump up from the low mist as if it had been lying on the ground. I watched it jump and pounce on something. It was sort of like watching a frog jump. I clearly saw arms and legs, though. It was just the blink of an eye. Then it did it again and again. It was hopping in the mist and chasing something. The turkeys, from the sound of it. On the fourth or fifth jump, and a scrabble into the fog, it suddenly caught one. It stood straight up and started walking right in the direction of the trailer. I saw the outline of it against the fog, and with the pines and the leafing trees behind it, I saw there was a limp turkey in one of its hands. The arm swung back and forth as it walked, and I saw the lifeless turkey wobble and sway. It walked very near the trailer. It didn't need to, I was sure, but I wouldn't move an inch. I did not want to get its attention. It didn't matter, because it knew I was there. It came very close to the trailer and held that turkey out as it walked by. I couldn't see the face clearly, but it felt like it was giving me some kind of a death stare. Maybe it was challenging me, like, what are you going to do about it? I took a turkey from you. Maybe it was just showing me it was a very successful hunter. That scenario could be interpreted probably a thousand ways. I know, because I've sat and interpreted it at least a thousand ways myself. It walked within 50 feet of my position on that deck. I tell you, it did not have to do that. It could have skirted the trailer completely through the pines and the other trees that ran between my trailer, the creek, the path, and the game trail that I assume it ultimately went to. It could have avoided me altogether. I have my own thoughts on why it did it like that. I'm sure you can guess. When it was gone, I immediately went in and phoned my father. He listened as I told him, and he didn't say much. He said, though, when the fog cleared, we would go have a look around. And we did. The fog lifted later that morning, and out we went. There were smeared, muddy prints all over, and exactly where I told my dad that I had seen the creature pop up and out of the fog and jump after those turkeys, while the evidence was right there to be seen. There were bushes broken, limbs cracked and ripped, Huge holes in the ground growth where it had jumped up and landed. My dad asked me what it looked like. But I could only tell him that it looked like a shaggy Bigfoot. It wasn't at all neat and short-haired like the old film. No, this was shaggy, hairy, messy looking. Later that month, it was a nice night, and I had the windows open. I was watching television and then all at once there came a smell through the window that just took my breath away. It stunk so bad. I got up to shut the windows, and when I did, I turned the lights on outside, and I had to jump back a little bit, because there it was, standing right to the side of the edge of the deck, and it was looking right up at me at the back door window. I got a better look at it that time, though. It was within 15 feet of me. It was nighttime, but with the light on, I saw its leathery face, the bulbous-looking nose, the thick lips, and the big jaws. It gave me a stare for three or four seconds, then it walked off into the darkness. I was shook. I can't lie. It was part monster, yet it looked so human. I felt like it came there, hoping that I would walk out at night which I often did. I sometimes would sit out there at night, but never after that. Thinking it might appease it, 
I left more food out for it after that, but I put it farther away from my trailer. There were a few times I would suddenly feel uncomfortable out there, and I would quickly retreat back to either the trailer or my parents' house, and I never went out unarmed ever again. I only had one more unsettling encounter with this creature. It was just after noon one day. It was a very clear day. It was June, but it was already very hot and humid, as I recall. I was walking back from my parents' place down the path. I had never seen the creature in broad daylight, so I wasn't thinking about it. All at once I heard a splash from the creek, which was only about ten yards distant. This splash was as if someone had dropped a huge car This was not a small splash. I stop and I look through the next break in the bushes that let me see through to the creek. And I saw Momo right there. I think it was trying to catch some of the small fish or maybe it was after a turtle. It was bent over with its feet spread wide in the creek. Its arms were hanging in front of it. The hands folded like a bridge deep in the water. It looked like it was waiting to scoop something up. Then it did the scariest thing. Very slowly, like an exaggerated slowness that you would see in a movie, it raised its torso just enough so it could raise its head, and it looked right at me. Then it let out a huff and a snorting growl. Then it straightened up, and the growl grew very loud and then it started leaving the creek. I turned and ran to my trailer faster than I think I've ever ran in my life. I got in the door and turned to slam it shut, and I about froze when I saw it was coming right up the front steps right behind me. I barely got in the door, locked it. It hit the trailer and it left dents in the old siding. The pictures on my walls shook, and I had one of those three-tier bill and mail sort of things. It had been hanging on the wall next to the door. It was knocked right off the nails and hit the floor. Apparently, I had pissed it off. I don't know what I did, but I did something. Maybe it was just me looking at it in daylight. Maybe that was enough. I called my dad, and he came out with his rifle and he brought one for me as well. Again, we went looking, and we went down to the creek. We saw Prince, but there was no Momo. Well, that was enough for me. For the rest of that summer, we drove our cars back and forth around on the road to get to each other's house. We did not use that path anymore. That fall, I managed to get a job in town and had saved enough by the next spring that I was able to move out and start my life once again. But I stayed out of those woods. I no longer thought of them as my parents' woods anymore. They belonged to Momo. My parents still live there. They now have renters in that trailer. But again, no one uses that path. My mom says that from time to time she still hears things out there. But neither her nor my dad have ever actually seen anything. And for what it's worth, I hope they never do. I always thought it was odd that it let me see it. My mom said she thought it was because I was younger and it might have seen me as a threat. Whereas my father, being so much older and visibly gray, maybe he thought he wasn't a threat. If it was a he, I don't know for sure. But in my opinion, if I was someone else and I looked at me and my dad side by side and I didn't know us at all, I would still peg my dad, gray or not, as the more dangerous of the two of us. He's clearly one of those alpha male types, whereas I'm really not. But who knows how Momo thinks and what he knows I do know, Momo never approached my parents' house, and it has never shown itself to either of my parents. 
I think back to how excited I was in the beginning, hoping that I could see it. All I know is I must have been crazy. After seeing it, I will tell you, it is no pleasant thing to see. Just call me no fan of Momo. Momo.